Okay, I haven't tested this out yet on a PC, so I can already see some things happening. So this is, uh, I'll talk mostly about SciStarter because I think it's a good way to introduce some of the very common topics that we often um, face in citizen science and crowdsourcing, which is a close cousin of citizen science, but more and more we're seeing these two terms delineated in the way that, um, in the way that they're defined. So we're basically a website here based in Philadelphia, although it's a global website um, that connects people to science that they can do. So we know this is citizen science, but most citizen scientists don't know that they're a citizen scientist. We know that millions of people enjoy science and nature. We know this for a fact, just in my work at Discover Magazine. At one point, Discover had seven and a half million readers every month. That's a lot of people who would read that magazine. Um, so we knew that they were out there and they were willing to pay for this magazine to read it. Um, and so we, we, this is, at this point, we, as me, myself, and I, back then started thinking, wouldn't it be cool if we, we could do a little bit more than just be passive consumers of this information? That led me to, go to grad school at Penn and start learning about people like me without formal science degrees to see how I might make a difference in the world through science without having to become a scientist or a policymaker or an educator and so forth. I was a communications undergrad major at Temple University. Partner that, pair that up with a minor in performing arts and it's no surprise that I had to live back at home <laughs> right after graduation. Um, but started working for a company that did a lot of administrative work for Discover Magazine, which is how I ended up at the magazine, um, and long story short, um, eventually became head of business development for their global um, public publishing group, which is magazines and books. Still couldn't get over this fact that I wanted to do more with science, and uh, Discover was owned by Disney Publishing. Um, so there were a lot of reasons to think about how to turn that marketing hat and that business development into ways that we can start moving people towards opportunities to act if they wanted to. So th all that is to give you uh, a little bit of a, a primer on how SciStarter came to be. It was an outgrowth of a um, project I was working on at Penn. So it was difficult for people to find these projects. So this is how this database came to be because I could not find these opportunities without using terms like citizen science, which was only, I only knew that term because I was studying this stuff at Penn. Um, SciStarter makes it easy for people to find these volunteer opportunities to get involved in science. You probably all know this. You're all familiar with citizen science on some level. Um, if I'm speaking to a different group, this usually surprises people because they'll start thinking like, well, I, d I didn't know I was a citizen scientist if I'm a birder who reports my um, observations to eBird, for example. I didn't realize I was a citizen scientist when I helped monitor the quality of our nation's rivers, streams, and lakes, for example. Um, and then there's a more passive type of citizen science where people are running programs on their computer. It still counts because that person did something. They didn't have to download that software um, to help those who are studying these types of fields. And sometimes people get it confused with this. They'll just assume like, oh, I'll have to tell my friend's son about this or teacher about this because it's automatically connected with science literacy and education and science lesson plans and so forth. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and in fact, I was speaking with somebody about that earlier where usually this is where the minds go and then we start to see projects that have received funding that are under the label of citizen science where there's really not any science involved, not tied to formal research. It's more of a classroom lesson or for your own edification. Um, Karen may talk about this later, but more, and maybe not, I don't know, more of the serious outcomes for citizen science, which is usually what somebody wants to know. If I get a call from a reporter, it's tell me, you know, great things. Tell me about these breakthroughs, which is kind of unfair because science hardly ever happens that way. So why are we expecting the citizen scientists to have to prove themselves with these amazing, remarkable outcomes or otherwise they're not legitimized? But we do have some great outcomes. More and more citizen scientists are being included in peer-reviewed journals as well. I think Zooniverse does the best job of that so far. Uh, Galaxy Zoo is part of Zooniverse. This is more of that crowdsourcing type of work where um, usually this is a case where there's an abundance of data in need of help um, from the public to classify. And the most common activity is annotating a file. Annotating a video file, annotating a, an image, um, sound files, deciphering whale sounds from audio recordings. And Zooniverse does this very, very well. 
And then we have these other types of citizen science projects. This is one of my favorite because it's so simple. Um, this is a project out of the University of Waterloo. Snow tweets is what it's called. And they invite people to tweet snow measurements from where they are. And they have an algorithm. They, they tie this all together through hashtags. God bless you. And it's serious science. This is a case where the researcher uses the data to calibrate instruments that are on satellites, weather satellites. And it's not just this professor's research. There's a number of these types of projects that are using basically ground truth data to calibrate satellites. We're running one right now. In fact, there's a, a pretty nice contingent of people from Philadelphia involved in this one with NASA. They have a relatively new satellite that monitors soil moisture levels. So this is called the Soil Moisture Active Passive Satellite, SMAP. Um, and we recruit and train and equip people to teach them how to measure and monitor the moisture levels in their soil. And what I learned from NASA, which is pretty in interesting, is that more than 90% of the time, the people are more accurate. So they actually use the data from the citizen scientists to calibrate their instruments. So that's one, this is snow tweets. And what we do at SciStarter is we quickly break out the goal and the task. We ask the researcher to do this. And when we first started doing this, there was some pushback from the researchers because how can we be so dismissive of their goals? That does not talk about their dissertation that they wanted to put in the project page, which is difficult when you're trying to recruit people to ask them to scroll through pages of information just to get at the information that they're looking for, which is what is the goal of your project and what exactly are you asking me to do? How can I contribute? So if the scientist or the researcher or the program officer project officer, community member, isn't able to articulate this, we then edit it before we publish these things that go up. This is also our way of vetting projects that appear to be a little bit more um, about the, the learning as opposed to being tied to some formal or informal research project where the data and the time is going to matter for people because we don't want to waste anybody's time there. So sometimes we'll see things that, you know, the goal might be um, for you to learn about blah, 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 and this is how we start to filter these projects. We work through partnerships. I'm going to try to, not to make this all about SciStarter, but like I said, I think it's a good way to illustrate some of the work that's being done with citizen science. There's a lot of media interest in citizen science now. Um, not surprisingly, we work with Discover Magazine, where I still work, um, and so there is a persistent presence there, project of the week. We just change it out. It's not even labeled SciStarter because it doesn't matter to us. Um, and the fact is we're providing lots of opportunities through our database. We have APIs that share the data in a way that the partner wants it. Some people, the UN, has our entire database and allows you to search for different projects using our project finder. Discover pulls up just one project a week and they'll cycle that through. That is important to us too. Same thing with the National Science Teachers Association because I don't believe that SciStarter will ever be um, what's called a destination site. We barely remember the name sometimes, Karen, and so we can't expect people to have to remember to go to SciStarter to look for these opportunities. We want to make sure that we're serving them up where they are already. Um, we do a lot of work at events. We just wrapped up four or five events with the Philadelphia Science Festival to do outreach, to actually engage people in citizen science projects while they're walking through for two or three minutes. Um, there's not a lot of time to, so sometimes we don't even use the word citizen science until they're finished. Like, and they get a sticker that I have for people too, like, you're a citizen scientist. And that might be their entree into this whole thing. So Pop Warner is a youth football and education organization, 400,000 football players, 100,000 youth cheerleaders. For every cheerleader that does a project with those science cheerleaders that Rebecca mentioned earlier, they get scholarship credit. So we work with organizations that build in the incentives already, and we would not be able to connect with 100,000 youth um, scholars, but we work with partners who already have that access. Some of the blogs that we manage include the Citizen Science um, blog on Public Library of Science, um, WHYY, uh, um, every so often you'll hear a story about Citizen Science that's done in partnership with SciStarter. Um, our projects are also featured on SciGirls on PBS, and we are just in the beginning of figuring out how our project finder can power the new Citizen Science Associations um, opportunities to start to really research the different types of projects that are out there and start to network um, the project owners together. Um, we have just a little bit in the database right now from Public Lab and hoping to expand that a little bit more, but 
that opened our eyes to the need to get some of the tools and the instruments out to people and I'll talk about that a little bit later and I know Phil's here we could talk about that too um, we work with museums more and more you'll see SciStarter and Citizen Science at museums because they're just an ideal destination for people to learn about local opportunities to get involved in citizen science become trained on the protocols and access the instruments because almost all of these projects require something an app but usually more than an app um, and then I also I do work at Arizona State University so it used to be part of the consortium for science policy and outcomes and then it was called the Center for engagement and training in science and society and as of a couple of months ago all of this was bundled together, so SciStarter and myself are now part of the School for the Future of Innovation in Society. They just kept getting bigger. So this is all just bragging stuff. This is what the um, website looks like. This is fairly dated. Well, this is probably a couple of years old, in fact, but 16, more than 1,600 projects and events are in there. So one of the things that um, we can talk about a little bit is the amount of duplication that exists. I'll pull this over here. If you're starting to think about creating a citizen science project or you're already organize, organizing one is to really start to think not just how you can share data with others who are looking for that and that you might benefit from as well um, but also just keeping in mind that every time a duplicate project comes up our job becomes more difficult at SciStarter. I was using the example of at one point this is maybe a couple of years ago I don't remember exactly when we could see when scientists register, or community members register their project. And the way that they tag it makes it very easy for us to start to see duplications. And at one point we had more than 12 projects, most of them funded by the National Science Foundation, just different directorates, that were all asking people to tag monarch butterflies. And then monarch butterflies follow the same migratory path. So that means if I'm somebody who's looking for something I could do in Philadelphia and I just happen to mention that I like butterflies. I'm now faced with 12 projects that look remarkably similar. Um, and we did hear from vo volunteers about, can I just do that for one project and share it with everybody else? Like, how am I supposed to know which one of these projects I should get involved in? And you will see if you take a little time through our database how much duplication exists. And it's a little frustrating. It's frustrating as a taxpayer that your dollars are being used for, for some of this duplication. And it's frustrating to know that when the projects aren't sharing the data until they're published, um, it's just so many missed opportunities. So that's one big thing that I just want to encourage you guys to just collaborate on some on some level, if for no other reason that you're bifurcating your potential pool of volunteers by having so many similar projects set up. The main thing that we do at SciStarter is to recruit and train and more and more equip participants um, because of this issue that, wow, now we're making it easier for people to find these projects. Um, and I'll show you some digital capacity that we're building with some grants from the National Science Foundation. Um, to make it easier for people to move from project to project, find a local project near them. Um, it seems so simple now to do the um, kind of geographic matching of where projects are, but when we started this not that long ago, the tools were still clunky and, and the, the migratory path of butterflies is a great example. You can't just type in zip codes. It's not always easy to use a polygon for our project owners, so we really wanted to use a smart system. And so now we just combined OpenStreetMaps with some databases that exist from USGS mm -hmm. that describe the type of land. So we do a, a quicker matching for those. Um, but then we started hearing from people about access to the tools because universities and, and most federal agencies are not permitted to sell these tools. And the way that they recommend them is through this wink, wink, nod, nod, go find it somewhere on the forestry supplies database of projects. So through focus groups, we started learning that that's a barrier to people to get involved in these projects. So I'll show you how we're going to look at that. This is a fun one. We're in the middle of Citizen Science Day. So this started, the day started April 16th, and the day ends May 21st. And that was how we kind of negotiated the day with other activities happening with, with the White House. So we kicked it off on April 16th, and it was a lot of fun. And then we'll kind of wrap up on May 21st with a lot of bio blitzes in partnership with National Geographic and the National Park Service. So that was just a quick screenshot. If you go to SciStarter, you can look for the events and see what's local here. I'm sorry for this ugly slide. There's actually a couple of them in there like that. Um, because I put the ugly ones came in last night or this morning. But this is where I started thinking about the makeup of the group and just this kind of reminder. 
these are the most common, and I'm sure this is not and this is not exhaustive, and I'm, I'm sure I missed some things here. But um, what your research question is, and what the community or what the community concern is. So the projects are developed sometimes by community members, um, and some part of what we want to do and do a better job of is helping those people who have these questions um, articulate their questions in a way that's going to allow people to support them and take them seriously. Um, to help um, kind of identify solid protocols to access the instruments that will give them good data. Again, all, all for the goal of sharing their data and their concerns with people who are not going to blow them off in essence. So that's a big concern that we have with the community groups is just getting them some more support along those lines. But more often it comes through a, a scientist or um, a practitioner who thinks carefully about a research question and how to involve the public in, in um, advancing that research question, right? So citizen science usually it's because they just don't have enough people on the ground to collect data or um, analyze data for their projects. Is it citizen science or is it outreach and we can have a debate about which is which and you know if there even should be a delineation there we're very careful to make sure that there's a, a very clear goal for that like I said because our job is to recruit volunteers and we want them to keep coming back and so we want them to feel like their time was not wasted does a similar project exist you can quickly look through the SciStarter database and and see if a similar project exists or you can just ask Karen or myself and we can help you um, kind of just do a quick landscaping of that the incentives and the motivations Every time I see a report that talks about the incentives and the motivations of why people do what they do, I sort of take it with a grain of salt because it completely depends on the task and what the project is. So the whole Zooniverse platform that I mentioned before, they will say that the motivation for people getting involved in their platform is to adv advance an area of research. Their project is, their platform is all online, right? So it tends to skew um, younger and male people who don't mind that type of isolation in the sense that you're not physically with other people. That's very, very different demographic than most of the water quality people. And that demographic is even changing too, but they're very clear. They want to connect with other people and they, they care about their environment and they care about nature. Um, so the demographics are very different and the motivations tend to be different. There's projects that pay people um, and they're out there to do that. There's projects that, um, you know, are gamified. So it's, people have different intrinsic values involved there. The appropriate use of technology is another one. We see a lot of duplications in apps, um, a lot of duplications in apps. And so there's, there's some that I think are getting, um, I would not be surprised if it becomes sort of the gold standard for some of the work that you're doing. That would include things like iNaturalist, um, if you're looking for species and identification of species because they have such a great back end where they have people who are immediately classifying that species for the person who just uploaded an, uploaded an image. All the bio blitzes that will be taking place are using the iNaturalist app. Not all of them, many of them are using iNaturalist. Um, so the, uh, the determination, I guess, of where you want to invest your grant dollars. Is it in the development of an application that can quickly get old fast? Um, or is it better for you to borrow some of the open tools that are out there for you and test it out a little bit? Sometimes an app is not the right way to go. We've seen projects where the best thing that project did <coughs> was just stick with a paper and pencil for their group to go out as long as they have a way for those people to enter that data in some way. On the flip side, there's some that just use your, your camera to post photos the Snow Tweets project that I mentioned, so simple. Tweet, hashtag, ruler. Very, very simple types of projects. So it's, it's probably talking with your group and getting to know your most likely type of volunteer involved and what makes more sense. And keeping in mind, too, some of the apps can't be used when you're thick in the forest without the wireless internet, too. So the certifications and qualifications, this is something that ASU is very interested in, so that's Arizona State University, um, and moving SciStarter towards this um, capability of coming up with formal and informal ways to translate your experiences as a citizen scientist into college credit, um, some kind of career path for you, um, with an eye towards the realization that a lot of people who are involved in citizen science don't have college degrees. That's excluding, I would say if you take out the birders and you take out the water quality people, 
this in-between group that we meet at the science festivals, for example, there's a lot of people out there who will say, this is a typical Discover reader. I love, I love science. I just didn't have an opportunity to go to college. Or, you know, I thought it would be more practical for me to be blah, 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 blue-collar workers. And so they still have an affinity for this, and they're, they feel really valuable when they're contributing to a research project. So we're looking for ways to see, can we give them some community college credits for what they're doing? Does it matter to them? And we only will really know when we have this system set up that allows them to have evidence for all the great stuff that they're doing. And I'll talk about that too <coughs> in a minute. Quality of data, I see on some of your papers here, is a really big one. And of course it's super important. It becomes extremely important when, is that you, Allison? Yes, so Allison, hi Allison. I'm gonna put Allison on the spot here because Allison's with EPA. And we have a number of conversations where EPA wants to uptake the data that people are giving. But if they're not using some kind of standardized protocol, some kind of uh, tool that they know has been calibrated by people who know how to use um, calibrate that instrument, it's really difficult for them to, in good faith, merge that data with federal data. And maybe I'll put, I'm putting Allison on the spot too because I think you handle these conversations really well. And the more that people understood, especially the community groups, like be super careful about how you set this up because you're gonna waste your time, you're gonna waste a lot of other people's time if at the end of the data collection, nobody's gonna use their da your data because you, you did no documentation, you haven't been clear about all this stuff. So that's a big one. Um, in there too is the um, data sharing part of this too. We see some groups that are just, maybe they're not sure about the quality of their data so they don't open it up and they don't share it and I feel like that's a little bit of a missed opportunity too. Um, there are so many efforts underway to figure out a schema that makes my head explode every time I think about it. But this is like the metadata groups that are attaching metadata to big data and little data. And we'll call the citizen science data little data. Put together, it becomes big data. But this is even just globally, groups trying to figure out how to put all this together. And I hope they figure it out. For us, we're just looking for ways to tag the individual bits of data so that they can be more discoverable. So for us, that empowerment of the volunteer is the single most important thing that we focus on every single time. So when we have volunteers say, can't my data be repurposed for these other projects? They might use different words. We immediately think, why aren't we just allowing you to be the owner of your data that you're collecting, bless you, and allow that volunteer to have this tagged in a way that they're single piece of data is discoverable to any researcher who wants to use it. Of course, there's privacy issues involved, but in many ways it gets around this issue of sending your data to one researcher who's going to hold on to it until their peer review paper is done or never really share that information, which happens too often. So it is a complicated mess, but there's so many great opportunities to just kind of make a difference in this space. Um, the privacy and the ownership of the data, this is what I'm talking about with the individuals. We did a poll of some of the project owners asking, um, how does the person access their data? They said, oh, that's easy, everybody owns their own data. They just need to know their unique identification number. And nobody does, most people don't. So being clear about what the licensing is, what the use of your data is, and how people can access, if not the whole aggregate database, then at least their individual piece of the pie there. And the policy implications. Most of the work that I do, I have five minutes, most of the work that I do is at, um, looking at this from a federal level, and that's almost always through Arizona State University. And what we're seeing is a merging, it's slow, of citizen science, plus some of these other forms of citizen science, which actually don't involve data collection or analyzing. This is more where people come together and they have these deliberations, public deliberations. It's, it's a talk form of citizen science. But we're starting to see where those people who are informing federal science policy at that level can certainly be in a position to also, if they'd like, collect some <coughs> of the data and be part of this solution. So right now there's 24, and probably more. I just did a very quick look at the 24 active tree projects in SciStarter. And because I have five minutes, I'm gonna kinda just zip through a little bit. Oh, sorry about that. I told you I did that early. Um, oh my gosh, please don't tell me. This is the, by far the ugliest slide, and now I'm gonna have to kill you with, this is part of, let me see if there's one more. 
that's the ASU coming out here. And Karen has seen this slide before too because it goes hand in hand with some of the work. This is the crossover, and I'll make these slides available too if you'd like to use these. This is really where the, the uh, practitioners and the academics are getting together to see like how does the citizen science and the citizen journalism and the science policy part actually start to come together? Um, and how do we research this and replicate it and start to document things? I'm happy to talk to you about this stuff. Um, as I mentioned, we see it at a federal level, but we know it's probably more effective at a local level. This is really designed for federal level stuff. And so the groups that are starting to use this now EPA would be one that is so close to using it. Um, NOAA, the uh, Department of Energy, and NASA, all three have contracted Arizona State University, Sci Starter, to start to put this model together. And so we actually have some outcomes that we can talk about. There's a big motion right now from the federal level to increase support for citizen science. Um, I don't know, Allison, it's probably 24. I don't know how many groups, federal agencies are involved in the community of practice. It's over 40 now. Okay, so you have over 40 people. 40 people from each one of these agencies spend their time talking about how to advance citizen science um, in a meaningful way. So, and again, Allison can talk more about it. They have a toolkit and a catalog of federally supported projects. Um, there was a White House memorandum back in September that really called for each agency to have a point of contact um, for support of citizen science. Um, let's see here. I don't know what the status is of the bill. I'm not sure what the timing is of the bill. Is it passed or not passed or not been brought up yet? Okay, so this is um, from Delaware. Senator Coons love this. Um, and this, I think, part of what this did was make people feel safer and okay about using volunteers for otherwise federally funded projects, right? And so kind of help them avoid this fear of maybe a lawsuit or is that somebody else's job that's supposed to be going on? And then I just mentioned some of those big data efforts. All right, now I'm really gonna have to move fast. Um, some emerging themes that we're seeing, and I love this, the blending of the maker community, which is kind of like the public lab group and others, um, together with social scientists, citizen scientists and so forth, we have, um, and policymakers. So we have a big summit at Arizona State University at the end of October called Makers Meet Public Science or Makers Meet Citizen Science. I had to think about that because we first had Citizen Science Meets Makers and it sounds like <laughs> you're probably not going to survive your plane trip there or something. I don't know. But so we bring the makers together with the project owners um, and the citizen scientists to start evaluating the tools that are being used. And because we've heard so often about people not using citizen scientists because they said, well, our sensors are $5,000. We can't just give them out to anybody. With, I think, clearly an, uh, not being aware of some of the low-cost tools that exist out there, and if they need to be modified a little bit, we can start bringing these groups together, um, training people how to calibrate these tools. Anyway, if you want more information on the October summit, just let me know. Um, the range of topics and participants is huge. Is uh, more and more from the health um, group that we see, microbes, you know, we had a lot of people in Philadelphia, but this was a global, I mean, this was a national project, collect microbes. All of them had to sign a waiver. And we activated this, by the way, at a citizen science, um, at a 76ers game. We actually shot out of the t-shirt cannon microbe collection kits during a game. <laughs> Into the stands with the science cheerleaders with instructions on how to swab your shoe and your cell phone using a sterilized Q-tip, sign your waiver, pass it down to the end of the aisle, and eight samples from Philadelphia were sent to the International Space Station, Chemical Heritage Foundation, the crack of the Liberty Bell, some really cool places for a three-part research project that we did in partnership with UC Davis. I'm happy to talk about those outcomes too. This is just bragging stuff. Um, what we're working on, spending a lot of time working on is an NSF um, pathways grant that allow for people to be able to keep track of the projects that they're doing um, in their own dashboard keeping it private or making it public. This is the way that we can start to have citizen scientists from one project who are unaware that their neighbor might also be a citizen scientist start to discover each other too. And I'm happy to talk about that as well. I'm gonna have to skip over some of this, but the London Library that we're just starting to set up um, will look something like this, where every project page will have a build, borrow, buy function for, the, for that tool. If it can be built, we'll tell you how. If it can be borrowed, 
physically going to a science center, or rec center, or a library to borrow that tool. We're going to show you where it's available. If it can be bought, buy it through SciStarter. And this is one of the software programs that we're looking at. And you can just look up where is this tool available. It's not there yet. And this will take a long time. In our scale, I mean, we move pretty fast. So for us, six months feels long. But it will probably be more like a year before we're able to roll something like this out in a big way. Um, and the personal e-portfolio is the, is the dashboard that I mentioned before that allows people to have evidence for the stuff that they're doing. So as we're starting to map things like competencies to their experiences, that they don't have to think too hard about, look at all this that I've accomplished, even just as a motivating factor for that citizen scientist to be able to look and say, I actually made a difference. Um, I think that's it. I'm going to end it because I got that stop sign about two minutes ago. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you. Thanks for your time, too.